Hello, my name is Dave Aarons. Welcome to my YouTube channel. So I thought we'd go over this time as just a basic kit to get a child involved in woodworking. Most of the tools that you're going to see here on the table and that I'm going to show you are sized towards a child. Okay, so we're going to start off with, I have an 18 inch 10 point handsaw and when I, like I said, it's sized for a child. So when I hold it, it feels a tad uncomfortable, but it's not bad. We're also going to need a back saw. This is a 10 inch 13 point and we're going to use this to do pretty much all our joinery work. We'll get into the different types of back saws later on. For right now, just get one and use it to do everything. For curved work, we're going to start off with a 6 inch coping saw and uh, just get an assortment of blades for the big box store. I usually find these at the flea markets for next to nothing. I think this one here I paid like five bucks for. I've gotten other ones for as little as a dollar. You can buy a brand new one now, um, running you about thirteen, fourteen dollars. This is not a very expensive tool. Doesn't matter whether you go vintage or new for right now. If you're doing work inside a project, we're gonna use a compass saw. And when we get to this tool, I'm going to have to demonstrate how to sharpen a saw. This one uh, I just recently got and I haven't really gone through it yet to, to get in good work in order. Some of the planes we're going to need, we're going to start off with the jack plane. This is a Stanley 5 and a quarter. It was marketed by Stanley towards shop classes for junior high kids. So this one is uh, 12 inches long and has a one and three quarter inch wide cutter. That's what we typically call the blades on these things as cutters. We're also going to need a number three. This is a Stanley Bailey and it's about just over eight inches long and it's got the same inch and a three quarter wide cutter that the five and a quarter does. Sometimes it's nice to have when your planes all have the same size cutter. This plane will probably, probably be the one that we actually use the most and even though it is good for a child size. It's actually good for adults too. This is a plane you can take with you well into adulthood. In fact, over the last year and a half, two years, I have come to rely on the Stanley number three for, for a lot more work than I, I ever thought I would. Also a low angle block plane. This is just good for if a child is a little bit younger and just qu can't quite handle a, uh, a bench plane yet like the number three. But what we find is this, they use this all the time for just little trimming jobs. So, and uh, this will carry you well into adulthood as well. The last of our planes is a spoke shave and a spoke shave is a plane, okay? It's just got a so shorter sole to it. So we'll be using this to do convex work or outside curves and uh, you can do a lot of modeling with, with wood with one of these things. But this is probably one of the most fun tools in the shop for a child to use. And this is a Stanley 51. There's also a Stanley number 151. I just happen to have uh, this, this one that's um, from the 1930s here. For chisels, I recommend you start off with three. Start off with a quarter inch, a half inch, and an inch and a half. The quarter inch, good for getting in those tight spots. The half inch is just a good general purpose all around chisel. This is probably the size that I use the most. The inch and a half is good for doing paring cuts to like flush trim dowels, things like that. So for drilling large holes, I recommend getting a brace. This one in particular is a six inch brace, which means that from the center line here to the handle is three inches. So when I turn this thing all the way around, it has a, what we call a six inch swing, okay? This is a good size for a child.
To drill our holes, we're gonna need some auger bits. And to start off with, you only need a few. What you really need is a quarter inch, three eighths, half, five eighths, maybe a three quarter. Every once in a while, one inch, but when you're getting up to the three quarter and the one inch, you're getting past where that three inch brace can take you. And then you might have to go up to a bigger brace, say like a, a 10 inch brace. Also, I have this uh, countersink, and this is for countersinking holes to allow clearance for flathead screws so they can sit flush. What the bits that are really good for kids are what's called center bits. The problem with center bits though is they're prohibitively expensive and they're also difficult to find. But what's real nice about this is you have a point in the center, you have a cutter here, okay, and then you have this knicker right here on this side. So that scores the circle. The cutter actually cuts the circle and the center point keeps it all aligned. And uh, it just, these are just beautiful tools. And I wish somebody would make them today, but um, yeah, they're, they're kind of hard to find. If you can find them, great. We'll, we'll work around it and use auger bits. I will be demonstrating these um, because I just do find that with kids that these just, they don't split the wood near as much as, as an auger bit will. For drilling small holes, we're gonna use an egg beater, or what's nicknamed an egg beater. This one has uh, the bits we'll need right in the handle. I have a few twist bits in there, usually for the most common size screws that uh, I wanna drill holes for. And this one's real nice because I gave this to a, let a, a, a five-year-old use one of these once, and I like this one because the gears are all protected. But that little kid just went to town drilling holes in the board. And um, yeah, I don't know what it is about this tool, but it just seems like every child loves to take this and you know and drill holes and things. As long as you keep them in the shop of the wood that they're supposed to be drilling, you're fine. Just uh, don't let them in the house. <laughs> you know? All right. And then I got with the, the hand drill, or the egg beater, nicknamed the egg beater, is some of these your uh, brad point bits. And they just seem to center real nice. So a few of those. Sometimes when we're cutting with a coping saw, we have to finesse those curves that we made. And a tool I recommend is what's called a foreign hand. What it is is on one side you have a flat file and a flat rasp. On the other side you have a half round rasp and a half round file. And uh, yeah, this allows you to get in there and smooth out those curves or to um, with a rasp, you can take it down to the line. Also with that, I recommend getting a little, uh, just a little smoothing file. This will make it a little bit smoother than the file that comes on the, on the foreign one. The smoothing file that you get is the same one that you use, you typically use for metal work. If you do metal work, what I recommend you do is the one you use for wood, keep it separate than the one you use for metal, okay? Because getting metal filings on uh, your project is just no fun. As much as we're going to use screws, we're actually going to use nails quite a bit too. So I recommend a small hammer. This one happens to be a 7 ounce. So once again, size for a child. But um, for doing small little nails, this, this is great. I, I, enjoy, I still enjoy using this little guy here. But yeah, get a good hammer. To start off with, get a claw hammer, okay? A small claw hammer. Yes, there are warrantons out there, but uh, then when I get to hammers, I'll demonstrate those. But for right now, 
a little claw hammer would, would be just fine. When we're hammering nails, we're going to need a set of nail sets. And here's three. They typically come in a set of three. Just go to the big box store and get these. It doesn't matter with these which ones you get. This one happened to come with this little punch as well. So yeah, and just a little set of nail sets. With the nail set, um, what I've been using lately, and this is truly is a multi-tool, is a Japanese, what's called a Japanese nail set. But you have the standard nail set down at the end here. You also have another nail set that's at 90 degrees to this one. You have a little tapered shaft here. It works great for lining holes. Okay, I can stick that in a hole. Let's say if I'm doing a, uh, a draw bore, okay, or I'm doing a pegged mortise, okay. But I can get that in there and align that. The other thing this is great for is sometimes with these planes when you're setting them, this lateral adjuster, you'll actually move it too far and you'll be going back and forth a lot trying to get your adjustment. Well, with this little Japanese, it's shaped like a hammer, so what I just do is I give it a little tap. And that usually knocks it over just enough so that I can get that blade in that plane uh, dead center and, and you know get get the, the, sh the shaving that I want to. For as much as we're going to be hammering our project together, we're also going to be screwing them together. So a good tool to get is a screwdriver. I personally like these foreign ones that you get from the home center. This one is has a bit that comes out on this side and you have a 3 16 flat tip and a Phillips number one on this side. This also is a quarter inch nut driver. On this side, I have a quarter inch flat tip and a number two Phillips and a 5 16 nut driver. So this is actually a, a six in one tool. Okay, but uh, it's just nice to have it all there. The other thing that's neat about these little, I paid $4 for this one. I mean, not too long ago. And um, what's neat about these is the Standard screwdrivers that come on these are actually hollow ground, where a lot of times when you see a, a flat tip screwdriver, the, the two sides of this, that screwdriver where it goes in the screw will be like this, okay? So you got that angle you got to deal with where it's actually in the slot to the screw. Well, a hollow ground screwdriver is just that, where they ho hollow ground it, so the more towards the tip you get, the more the straighter it gets going into the slot of the screw, okay? And typically we go to, a lot of woodworkers like to buy grace screwdrivers or gunsmithing screwdrivers to get around that. But uh, I just found out that this cheap little foreign one, is, it's already hollow ground for you and it's only $4. So ugly, ugly red plastic handle though, so we might have to change that. So our most important category of the tools that we're going to need is going to be marking and measuring, of course. Okay, so what we're going to start off with is we're going to get two squares, okay? One is going to be what's called a tri-square or non-adjustable square. This is an eight inch. This is a vintage one, and um, but it doesn't matter. What you want is just a 90 degree square so you can check your boards real quick and see if you have a true edge to a face, okay? And we'll be getting into that here shortly. The second square I'd recommend you get is what's called a combination square. You can do the same thing with this, okay? You can, you can if you had to only get one, get this one actually. But uh, what a combination square does for you is this ruler will slide, okay? And this is an old vintage one from like the 1930s. So this one's kind of weird. It actually flips around and it is to get your smaller measurements over here, okay? You can slide back and forth. So if I want to run a line, let's say one inch, I set this to one inch, lock it down with that little wheel there. I got my one inch distance, and then I can run with like a pencil and, and, and mark that, okay? But I can also use this to set like the depth of a mortise, or let's say if I wanted to go on a three quarter inch board, I could set this 
to go down three quarter of an inch, maybe to, to show where I want to cut a rabbit or something like that. And we'll get into all these terms as we go along. But a little six inch combination square, it's a good tool to have. It's probably the most used measuring tool in my shop. This marking knife is what's called a double, double bevel marking knife. But on one side, it's flat, okay? Then on this side is where you have your two bevels. You have one here and then one up here, okay? So if I'm doing this, I put the flat side against the tool and then I mark. So what happens with that, this being flat and the bevel only being on one side, this allows me to get right up to my tool and make that mark very precisely. If I want to go to the other side, well, I just flip everything around and then I just use the other bevel running the flat side here. So that's why it's very important to have a double beveled one or sometimes it's called a spear point marking knife, okay? But uh, yeah, and then be able to run that side, okay? Two tools probably used the most is the uh, combination square with the marking knife. Also we're gonna need some sort of ruler, okay? Some sort of measuring device. This happens to be a, a four-fold, two-foot ruler, which was very, very common in the late 1800s, early 1900s. In fact, it's been common for a long time. In fact, this was so common that in men's trousers, there was a pocket sewn just to hold this, okay? Because a lot of the trades use these. It was not just woodworkers, joiners, cabinet makers, tilers, um, masons, you name it. A lot of trades would carry this, okay? This one happens to be an architect, was marketed as an architect's ruler, and this one has a few different scales on it. But uh, we'll get into that when we get to, to rulers. But yeah, for right now, just uh, this is a two foot, four fold, and this one happens to be made out of boxwood, and it's brass lined all the way around. Another good tool to have is what's called a marking gauge. But what you have is you have a movable fence, okay? Be able to lock that down with this thumb screw. There is a pin sticking out that's sharpened to a point. And when you run this against the against a board, it allows you to scratch a line, okay? And um, yeah, we'll be using this quite a bit, so. Another tool that's good to have is what's called a bevel. And this is for setting out angles, where I can move this and then be able to set that anywhere. And then uh, this is good for, this is good to start off with like when you're doing dovetails, stuff like that. Or if you want to do some sort of bevel cut. Okay, when you're doing angles, you always have a 45 on your combination square. The bevel takes care of any other angle that you need, okay, that you want to set. So you set it and lock it down. And from there, using your mic marking gauge once again, or your marking knife, I'm sorry, you'll be able to, to, to mark that line. One of the most powerful tools we're going to use is called the divider. And you know this um, now as, as a compass where you have a, you know, a pencil that will go in this side and uh, you have a point here. Compass divider, they're the same thing. One uses a pencil, one has two points. So with the divider, if I want to mark out things, what I can do with this is I can uh, set these two apart and then I can precisely find the, find the middle of something, okay? I can lay out in threes of something, fours, whatever, okay? But whatever distance I set by the, between these two points, as long as I keep that setting, I have that setting, and it allows for repeatability, okay? And uh, with one of these, I can find the center of a board a lot faster than using my, my combination square, but you're gonna find that um, yeah, using dividers, very, very powerful tool. In fact, um, I'm going to recommend that you get a big one and a smaller one. 
you might even want to throw in a compass. This is something that's actually a tool that's worthwhile to have multiples of. Thank you so much for watching my channel, Dave Aaron's Woodcraft. Please like and subscribe. Please leave a comment. Let me know if there's any tools that I should have included on the list or what your favorite tool is that you use with the child. And um, yeah, thank you very much for watching. Appreciate it.